420, 420, 420 long years. I smoke lots of reefer, drank lots of beer. Every day at 420, we're gonna settle the score. And for 20 long years, it's been 20 past four. Hello, welcome to 420 Live. I'm Jeff Kravitz. Welcome to this Tuesday edition of our distraction, our dalliance, our uh, new reason to be on the planet. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of things going on in my, the old world that I used to live in, the world of photography, of celebrity culture, of uh, bullshit. But uh, <laughs> things have slowed down on the bullshit front. I mean, escalating in other parts, slowing down in some parts, you know, and we're at this nice calm place in our country right now where our numbers are down. People are getting vaccinated. I saw today 40,000 lives have been saved because of vaccination. Uh, you know, it's absolutely incredible what's happened in a year, but then we see what's happening in Europe and we're worried about this. We're worried about that. Meanwhile, things are being scheduled. Events are coming up on board. Concerts, festivals move to the fall or it's really unbelievable what's been happening out there, folks. But welcome to 420 Live. Another day, another another dollar, or not really a dollar. Uh, today, I have a very special show. I'm uh, excited to interview somebody I've worked with for decades that uh, has been on the other side of camera with me. We're going to get to my friend Quentin Schaffer here in a minute. But, uh, you know, HBO has been a place, a home for me now for the past three years decades. When I moved to Los Angeles in the late 80s, I was lucky enough to connect with my good friend, Mara McCallion, through another friend of mine, Kathy Fisher. And it led to a long and illustrious career of uh, photographing for the uh, what ended up being the hottest network on the planet. Let's face it, HBO was the king and queen. They held all the pieces. They had hit after hit after hit. They were the envy of every network when it came around to award season. You know, I started in the late 80s with shows like Dream On and uh, the, the uh, first in 10, I believe. Uh, it was like the early days of HBO where the big thing was seeing a boob and hearing a four letter word because those were the things they really didn't allow on television. Now you look at TV and it's, oh my God, I watched Euphoria the past couple nights another HBO show. And it, that show makes me question my sanity because you just can't believe what you're seeing on screen that these high school kids are supposedly doing. But uh makes me long for my days of the experimental high school years and going through all the, the rites of passage. But to be able to grow up with a network like HBO and watch them change was a, a, amazing for a guy with a camera. And, you know, I was thinking today, it's, it's almost time for me to get ready of my, my HBO book, which would be all the stuff I've shot over the years of the parties. But, you know, over the years, I've seen it all. Sex in the City, Sopranos, Game of Thrones, of course. You know, all the amazing shows HBO has been, you know, created these brands, these lifelong brands and made stars of these people, sent them to the moon, basically. And, you know, it was absolutely kismet that put me in the place I was in. And the amount of people I've worked with over the years, I'm just very thankful to have had an opportunity like I've had because it really helped shape me into who I am. I mean, being able to do these jobs and having to work in a corporate environment with all these high profile celebrities and to, to be able to get along and being able to stay in the room without them saying Kravitz. I mean, that has happened. Kravitz, get the fuck out. Uh, I've heard that before, but you know, I was invited in, it was rarefied air and you know, I, I can't even wrap my head around all the things I've shot, all the people holding Emmys, all the people at the different parties and stuff that I've photographed over the years for HBO. And, uh, you know, I started this show as a dalliance, as a distraction from my daily life when we came in the pandemic. And, you know, I was sitting here listening to the theme song and looking at the graphic. And I remember a year ago, I didn't have a graphic or a caricature. Thank you, my friend, Larry Solitran, for the amazing art that we use every day to open the show. Vince Herman from, uh, Leftover Salmon, who wrote that theme song for me right while I was interviewing him on the show. That's actually the recording of him on the show. Uh, you know, we've kicked it up to the next level here. And to have a professional like Quentin Schaffer 
hit me up and be like, Jeff, I wrote a book and I'd really like to come on your show and talk to you. I mean, this guy has facilitated more interviews and sat on there and watched more people question more people. I was trying to wrap my head around it when I was thinking about Q and all the times we had together and all they did was interviews. So it's my pleasure today to introduce my good friend, Quentin Schaffer. He's got a new book out called Gods of Sound. Hello, Quentin. How are you there? Can I'm you hear here, me? Jeff. Good, good. Can I plug in my... No, no. You, you, can you hear me okay? Or no, you can't Just hear me. Just a minute. All right. <laughs> Try. They can, can they hear me? I can hear you, yes. Oh, I can't hear you, though. All right, then maybe we should try to plug so in those. Uh, put those the earplug in. in. See, this is the old man technical difficulties that All I've been right. dealing with since day one. Right, maybe better. your heads. Is that better? Oh, that yeah, better? I got it now. It's weird. Oh, it worked in our our, our little pre thing, but uh, yes, it doesn't always yes, work. So, Quentin, you were you left HBO just before pandemic. HBO made this big move, and uh, we had new bosses come in and a new company come in, right? That is true. I think some people think I planned this. It was, uh, I've been gone actually a year and a half now after uh, 39 years. And um, it was uh, amazing all the changes that happened. I was going to be home anyway. So the pandemic didn't change too much. Right. Um, but uh, it, I had to find something to do because um, I think you're the same, Jeff. After doing our jobs full time and all of a sudden putting the brakes on, you'll drive your wife and family crazy unless you find something to do. Right, but th this was nothing that was planned. It was kind of the way the politics of the business worked out. Exactly, yeah. I had worked, as you know, uh, for um, Richard Plepler, our chairman and CEO for, boy, 27 years. And when he left the company, um, usually the PR guy goes with the CEO. Um, and we were very close. Uh, so when he left, they brought in Bob Greenblatt, and Bob, you know, he's very nice to me, but I knew he was a West. He was on the West Coast. He wanted to bring in his his person, um, and that was sort of understood. But they, I have to say, they were. It was a very graceful exit. Um, I, uh, the people at Warner Media, um, you know, were very respectful, and they allowed me to do a final TCA, which was a lot of fun to say goodbye to all the critics there. And you were there. It was my my farewell. Partner. Yeah, it was, it's unbelievable. And, and the TCA is like the, the Television Critics Association, which you're talking about. When we first started doing them in the 80s, it was like Chinese water torture. You were in there for eight <laughs> hours a day for multiple days in these dark rooms. It's true. I. It's so funny. We had... Um, the, the HBO was given, I think, 10 hours or something, which, and then we, we finally got reduced to three hours. I don't know how we filled 10 hours because that was many years ago when we didn't have as much stuff as today. Yeah. And, and now everybody wanted to talk to everybody at HBO and HBO was the hottest thing. But I have noticed in the past year with this whole emergence of the streaming networks that HBO has kind of leveled down and is now caught in the, in the, in kind of in the, with everybody else. Yeah, exactly. I think when we were just the cable category, uh, you know, we were dominant for so long and, and really dominant over the networks and, you know, AMC, FX, you know, there were good networks there, but network, we watched Netflix make this ascent and um, spending more and more money and getting good shows. Uh, so now it's, uh, uh, boy, it's no one owns the field right now. Uh, I mean, Netflix, I think, has the the probably the senior spot because they spend 16 billion dollars on programming um and the others are probably less than half that so um i think it's yeah it's it's gone are the days <laughs> when you could run the you know run the business um i mean we we were the king for a long time and you and, and you left on, you left on top honestly i gotta say it was what happened is game of thrones ends um, and you know, I left, you know, shortly after that. So I was there for the big farewell parties, as you know, you covered those well. And, um, and it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, I got to say, if I had to plan an exit, it couldn't have been better timed. Well, it, it, let's talk a little bit about the early days of HBO. What, where did you come from before you started working at HBO? Yeah, I had a little experience. I worked, believe it or not, nine months for Ringling Brothers, Barn Bailey Circus, doing the most basic publicity, um, you know, any publicity was good publicity, whether it was good or bad. Uh, we had a unit, there's a controversy about a unicorn 
with a horn fused on a horse and uh, humane groups were coming out and we would go, come see for yourself. You know, <laughs> it's totally the opposite of the corporate side. Um, and we did clown auditions, showgirl auditions, uh, elephant walk down 10th Avenue and manure give it ice. I seriously, we were bagging elephant manure uh, to give that away as a gimmick. I, so I did that about nine months. And then I went from there to ABC, WABC and worked there for a short period of time, about two years, and then my boss went to HBO, and I followed her there, uh, a woman, Judy Torello, and um, the department, the HBO PR department at that time was a total of five people. I mean, I being the fifth. And so, you, you know, they were so appreciative of any story you got, they were really happy for it. Um, and I was covering sports, music, and series, and my first month at HBO, Jeff, this is, uh, um, not everybody knows this. My first month at HBO, they sent me to Nashville, Tennessee for a music concert. It was a country music, a family affair. Uh, the headliners were people like Jerry Lee Lewis, the Kendalls, Roger Miller, you know, a whole collection of country music folks. And I went down to Nashville and all, my main job was to interview Dick Clark, who was the producer. And when I, after I interviewed him, just for press releases, not for a story, I then interviewed um, Jerry Lee. And I said, what do I talk to Jerry Lee about? And he says, whatever you do, don't ask him about marrying his cousin. And I said, <laughs> like his 12 year old cousin, I said, well, I'm not gonna do that. I said, this is a press release. So I go into the interview uh, with Jerry Lee, it's in his dressing room and he's sitting at a piano. He's got a Coke can up above and there's four guys in cowboy hats sitting on the couch behind me. And as I ask him questions, very innocent questions, you know, where, when you start to play music, who were your big influences? Every time he'd answer, he would do a little trill on the piano and hit a note, like the note was a period. And then I said, okay. And then he'd be drinking his Coke. And I didn't know at the time that the Coke was not quite a Coke. It had some alcohol in it, but I assumed it was a Coke. So at one point I asked a harmless question. I don't even remember the question. It was so harmless. And he turns on the piano seat to the four cowboys. And he said, he goes to me, I don't like that question. He said, I think I'm going to have to kill you. And I said, I kind of chuckled nervously. And he goes, you think I'm serious, son? You, I mean, you think I'm kidding you, son? And I go, no, no, I'm sure you're not. And he turns to the cowboys and said, how many of you think I ought to kill him? I've never seen these people in my life. And two of them raised their hands. And I was this this scrawny, pathetic person. And then, this is the truth, I owe my soul to him. Roger Miller came into the dressing room. You know, the guy, King of the, Hill, King of the Road, trailer for Sailor Rent. He comes in and does this gospel evangelist and says, hallelujah, the Lord. And he got everybody, everybody on your knees. He got everybody in that room, Jerry Lee, the four cowboys, and then of course myself on our knees, listening to him doing this gospel thing. He was apparently really high on coke or something, drugged out. But it was such a distraction that I was able to leave the interview and said, why don't we finish this tomorrow? And then that night, his roadie, Jerry Lee's roadie said, Quentin, you want to come? We're, we're going to the motel uh, down in Nashville. We're going to have some ladies there. And I said, you know, I just joined this company. It's owned by Time Inc. And I don't think I should be there, but thank you. So then the next day I did my interview with Jerry Lee. Uh, he finished the interview and he turns to me and he gives me a hug and says, you know, son, I was just toying with you yesterday. God bless you. Give me a big hug. I thought of my first month at HBO, I thought that was my last. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, there's a reason they call him the killer. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. Oh, you don't want to, you know, when he gives you that glare that, you know, you, you're just not sure. Um, and he's an immensely talented guy. And the sad thing is, three years ago, when uh, Ringo Starr was inducted in Cleveland at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Jerry Lee was there with his whatever, fifth wife and whatever. And we saw her in the elevator. I did. And um, I said, oh, you know, I'm hoping to see your husband tonight because I'd seen them at a distance earlier. He'll be at the table. You know, he's going to sit with Paul and with Ringo. And so sure enough, he was there. And then at one point I wanted to go over and I wanted to tell him, you're never gonna remember me, but, and I was gonna kind of relate this and figuring just, it would be fun to put some closure to it. 
And sadly, he had to leave really because he had a really bad back. Um, and I was really disappointed. So I never got that that moment of closure with him. And, and let's face it, those rock and roll hall induction dinners were seven, eight hours of sitting oh, around in a chair. You know well, like when you watch the TV show, it's a good three, taught three hours, um, you know, that Gary Getzman and company would do and others. Um, but yeah, that eight hours, it was long and long speeches. So when, when did you realize that HBO was heading in a different direction? What was the, what was the turning point? Yeah, well, you know, when I was there, the early years, we were doing this uncut music concerts, you know, uncut comedy. We had Robin Williams, Billy Crystal, Whoopi Goldberg. We were doing comic release, all that stuff. And it was all feeling good. We we're getting a little bit of noise. Um, but it really wasn't until, um, and we did Dream On. Uh, Dream On was an early show with not necessarily the news. Those were the two shows. Boxing also got a lot of attention because we had really good fighters before paper, they went to pay-per-view. But Dream On uh, was a show that the two showrunners, Marta Kaufman and David Crane, the next show they did after that was Friends. So we were in business. And when Friends took off, I said, wow, this is cool. These really good people are coming through here. And, you know, maybe we can't keep them, but it's great to get them. Uh, so I would say, though, if I jumped ahead a little bit, the shows that really were turning points, I'd say, were um, uh, the Larry Sanders show. And Oz, those were two shows that when they hit, uh, really resonated, uh, especially with the critics. The critics had never seen um, shows like either of them. Um, and we got a lot of really positive reviews um, on Larry Sanders. Larry Sanders never got a great number, but it spoofed the business and it did, it carried its weight in gold. So that was uh, in the 90s. And that was, I'd say, a, a big... Uh, or that was the, yeah, the 80s, I guess, 80s, 90s, wherever that divided. Yeah, and then after that would be Sex in the City, you think? After that was the real? Exactly. Then things kind of took off. And um, we had at one point, it was just every category. You know, you had Sex in the City, you had Sopranos, you had Curb Your Enthusiasm, you know, the, and then The Wire. And the, 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 the hits just kept coming. And it was almost like too much. It was, it was great. But it was a lot of events we did and a lot of shows to promote. Um, and we had great people doing them. Do you have a personal favorite? Now, I mean, you, I can ask you this now because now you, you can know, on the payroll. No, you actually can. You know, I would say when I go back and look, um, and I have to judge them separately because in the comedy category, uh, for me, it was Curb Your Enthusiasm. Uh, there was just something. It just even more than Larry Sanders. I loved, but Curb for me, he just always found a way to hit something original, unique. Uh, the drama, uh, it's really a race between Sopranos, um, The Sopranos, Game of Thrones, and The Wire. And I'll be very candid on The Wire. The Wire, when I first saw The Wire, I liked The Wire, but I did not know how brilliant it was uh, because when I was watching it at the time, the lingo, it was so real and so street, and I, didn't, I couldn't pick it all up. And then when I rewatched it, and I've actually, believe it or not, watched it with the subtitles too. It was brilliant. It's such a brilliant show. And David Simon, I think the fourth season of The Wire may be the best of any season of any show that we've done. Uh, that was the education show. But between Game of Thrones and Sopranos, it's so tough because I there's a bit of distance from Sopranos now. Right. Um, but when you rewatch episodes, you know, You'll hear, you know, the, you know to, to me, they were kind of the same show, just in different time periods. Exactly. So it's, it's those, those, those are the groups. I mean, I, it's, it's, um, you know, I think we've done other great things, Succession and Big Little Lies and all those other shows. But for those, I'd say um, it's those, those would be the guys. The shows. All right. Now, now I got a real curveball for you. <laughs> if you were still there, yep. what do you think, what direction would HBO go in? Because right now they're, they're, kind of, I feel floundering. I don't feel direction there. I mean, they're lost in the sea of streaming. Yeah. When I'm watching, I go from HBO Max to, to Disney to, uh, you know, to Netflix. I'm back and forth on all of them. And I don't really find anything in HBO that I'm like trying to figure out why do I need to keep paying to keep yeah. it in. And before that was never a question because it was included in with your package. Exactly. Well, I think what they're, I don't know for sure. I think they're eventually, you know, HBO, it's all being combined. This HBO Max right now, you get HBO, you, you know, you can switch over to HBO Max and it, they want to have it one network. Um, the one thing for me that makes me a little uneasy 
is one of the things we rarely did at HBO were uh, sequels when I was there, you know, uh, sequels, prequels. Um, and they're starting to do a lot of those. And I, it's fine if you get a huge slate to fill, but I think what made us the best was the original voices and things you've never seen before. We're always ahead of others, We're doing true blood ahead of the vampire craze, you know, Sopranos when there were no other mob dramas. Um, you know, girls when, you know, we had an audience at the time, which was a much younger than your HBO audience. Those, the, that's one of the things I think worries me. And I only say it because I think Casey's a really good executive, Casey Bloys. Um, and he's a great, if he just had to do HBO, he's brilliant at it, but he's now got huge canvas, you know, HBO Max and HBO. Um, and it may be why um, they need to fill the coffers with these the sequels and prequels. I just find there's not a lot of sequels uh, or prequels that I liked better than the originals. You know, like you, you can find the exception, you know, you'll say, well, what about Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul? Better Call Saul is very good. It's not as good as Breaking Bad, but it's really good. Or The Godfather 1 and 2, they always say, but generally your expectation is so high and you come back in and it just, it's hard to capture that magic, I think, a second time. Well, without a doubt. And I think everything's kind of been played out now. It's just like, we're kind of, you know, we just keep putting new tires on the car. Exactly. I'll tell you the other thing they got to do, which HBO has done its whole career. You know, there was a bidding war and everybody was grabbing, oh, I want to grab this Shonda Rhimes. I want to grab JJ Abrams. I want to grab, you know, they were grabbing all these big people. But I think what HBO did so well is we nurtured people you had never heard from before, or we took people who had done things elsewhere, like David Simon had done network television, as had David Chase, but their experiences didn't put them at the level they are now. And we basically gave them free reign. Guys, here, paint, paint, you do whatever you want. And I think that is something they can't get away from. I think they got to go back and really do that. Well, also back in the day, television had all these restrictions that HBO didn't. Oh, you got the nudity, you have the cursing, you have the violence, you can show yeah. all these things. And now, and everybody can do it now. Exactly. Everybody can do it. There's no more cost of, you know, it's just like whoever's in can do it because we don't have the same kind of laws because it's not public broadcasting. It's all private yeah. broadcasting. Exactly. No, you're exactly right. And I think that's, I, the other thing too, is I think you got to be careful. Netflix has you know, really deep pockets. And I don't think you want to get in a war with them in terms of bidding for stuff. I think you want to just keep nurturing. Um, I think Warner Brothers has a lot of good product, a lot of good writer deals and director deals. Um, I think uh, it's just, they need to figure out how to effectively do this. Um, but also they got to make money in that side of the business too. So it's, uh, I'm kind of glad I'm not in the midst of this. I know there are currently several books written on HBO um, and uh, one Jim Miller's doing, who did the ESPN's CA um, Saturday Night Live books. He's he's the first one out there. Is going to I think doing to do a big definitive piece. Uh, another guy, Dade Hayes, um, and his partner. They're writing a book on the streaming wars, just on the streaming services. And I think uh, John Coblin um, and his partner Felix Gillette, they're doing something HBO related. So you got, you know HBO. It, the question is when they their books come out. Is this a, a closure piece on HBO or is it HBO's continuing on its ride? So we shall see. Yeah, I, I think that the, 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 it's too much competition right now. I just feel that it's just crazy. Like I saw Paramount Plus advertising and I just don't know if I have the bandwidth for that or if I need it. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, how much do you need? Where before everything was included and you yep. the, the viewing, you viewed what you watch TV with a remote in your hand. Oh, and yeah. when you were bored, you would flip the channel. And yep. now it's all destination TV. It's so true. And and what happens is you, you know, you with your streaming services, you got, I mean, I've got this unlimited DVR. I can any I can stockpile stuff and all. But you do find in a certain month, you go, God, I really didn't watch that streaming service at all. And I think that you will see much more churn. Uh, when the cable operator uh, had a package. It was hard to get rid of HBO or Showtime. If I want to get rid of it, well, if you get rid of that, you're going to get, you're also going to lose this and this. And also um, they made it, they made it like, oh, for $14.99 a month, you get exactly. HBO and Showtime and stars and all, you know, they made it intriguing, right. right? Yeah. And then the younger generations, you know, your kids, my kids, they're not used to paying for anything. I mean, they, you know, I think 
Well, if they we have pay Netflix, for it all. <laughs> oh, exactly. Well, they have Netflix. Of course, Netflix is looking at their password sharing. You know, your kids are getting it through you. Yeah, but Netflix made a huge leap from delivering DVDs to my mailbox to like all of a sudden drop a $220 million assigned David and Dan. Oh, I know. It's true. It was unbelievable. The money they spend is, is startling. It's crazy, but they, they've always been chasing HBO's tail. And even yep. last last Golden Globes, I remember being in the room. Uh, yep. I think it was the it was the last time we had a party at the Beverly. Uh, where was at the uh, Beverly Hilton and yep. uh, watching everybody counting up and uh, everybody at management being so excited that we beat Netflix by one. Oh, exactly. You know, and, and now that, I don't even know how you get you know how that's even going to be counted. It's tough because every year one of the other networks that you haven't you've sort of maybe counted out they come surging forward. Um, and you know there could be a year that it's Amazon or you know Hulu that are. Well, it was that one. Each would have that one property exactly. that all of a sudden got them the attention. Like Amazon, I can't remember what the first one was. Um, yeah, they had one. Oh, they had the Transparent, I think, right? And then right. they had Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which got oh, yeah. a critical acclaim. So yeah, you can't turn your back because everybody's gearing up, and they know you have to have some breakout hit that everybody's going to talk about. And that's what we had at HBO. We always had it. I think last year, uh, you know, with Casey had um, The Watchmen, which got a lot of attention during that Black Lives Matter. I think that was a really good thing. Um, well, that was a great show, but unfortunately only one season, which I was kind of bummed. Exactly. Yeah, they had two last year that I thought were quite good. The other was the Stephen King. You cannot lose with Stephen King. Oh, The Outsider? Outsider. Um, really great. Really, really good. Fun. Um, yes. And they're not doing another, I don't, no, the full story, but they, you know, I think that you could have done a sequel. You had to get good scripts, but um, but those are two I did like last year. But you do need to get those tentpole shows, and that's what Game of Thrones. I mean, Game of Thrones, Jeff on HBO was getting at its final episodes thirty four million viewers. Wow! Um, and that was just a phenomenon. Now, some of this is because of Mar McKillian's publicity efforts, of course, but uh, <laughs> no. But seriously, I mean, that show was. Um, it's just a phenomenon, the way Sopranos was. Everybody was talking about it. We, you can tell when the talk shows, the late night talk shows joke about it or Saturday Night Live spoofs it that you've really made it. Oh, yeah. It was a phenomenon. And to watch the whole thing and that whole cast, which was really interesting, didn't really have a big star when they started. Exactly. Oh, it's, it, that's the greatest thing about HBO. We didn't go after these big names. You know, you, you got these like Game of Thrones and Sopranos. Sopranos, the only name you really knew at the time was Lorraine Bracco. And right. her character almost became secondary, you know? And then in Game of Thrones, I mean, Peter Dinklage, I think is the one you might've known um, from his- and Sean, and Sean Bean too, right? And Sean Bean, exactly. But but most of the others were just names that, and just within a year or two, they, they were just skyrocketed to fame. It was just- <laughs> Amazing to watch. It, it was an unbelievable phenomenon to be part of. And you know, I'm, in the, I'm almost done the Fire and Blood, which is the uh, prequel. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, people love dragons. People are going to love dragons and blood. I mean, you know, I think that people are going to watch the prequel and tune in for it because it was just such phenomenal. Uh, it's phenomenal writing. Yeah. And he's George, you know, George R. R. Martin has such a brand right now. Um, you know, he just, I can tell you, though, he better finish that Isn't that unbelievable? Book. It's unbelievable. <laughs> he released <laughs> Fire and Blood before he finished book seven. I know. He shows up at all these at certain events. I mean, maybe COVID is a good thing to keep him in Santa Fe or Colorado, wherever he's writing, uh, to get this thing finished. Because we I, thought- I, I honestly don't think he's interested in finishing it. Yeah, I know. That makes you wonder. And he's got another book after that to finish the whole <laughs> series. And if this one's taken so long, I can't imagine what the other one's going to take. Well, speaking of books and speaking of authors, I have a copy of <laughs> Gods of Sound right here written oh, by <laughs> Q.M. Schaffer. I mean, and I, I have to say, this is right up my alley. This is, uh, it's, an, it's almost, I, I'll tell you what I feel. A cross between player one, ready player one meets guitar hero. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's one of those things, Jeff, as I said, you know, when the pandemic hit, I got it, wanted to find something to do, and I'd always wanted to write a novel. And I had an idea for something like seven years ago. Um, in fact, the whole, there was an incident seven years ago. My son was 10, a very good musician, um, and he was supposed to be in a 
a talent show at his school. And my wife signed up a day late. Uh, and they don't even call it a talent show. They call it a variety show because there's very little talent in it, I should say. <laughs> and so my wife signs up a day late. She called up and said, no, we can't get him in. And he was going to play uh, Blackbird going right into Black Dog. And he could play this in fifth grade really well. So I called the woman. I said, listen, my son, uh, you know, a little heartbroken, you know, would you be able to get in? Well, no, I'm sorry, you missed the deadline. And if I allow you in, then how do I, I have to let everybody else in? And I said, okay, well, how many other people are at demanding to be in that aren't signed up? Well, that's not the point. It was this, this whole bureaucrat thing. And so I just sort of let it go. And so in my book, that becomes a really central thing near the beginning uh, because somebody enters his life, this Joan Jett-like character, and transforms it. And the same incident happens. Now, that's a minor thing, but that's what triggered uh, my storyline, which was then propelled, uh, and this is my therapy session with you, Jeff, <laughs> by um, just a lot of uh, my love of music, of course, but also uh, sort of bullying that I experienced in junior high and high school. And sort of, um, you know, I was very scrawny, couldn't make a muscle, that sort of thing, that sort of helpless feel. And that was what I felt this character um, was experiencing as well, like sort of an outcast, um, somebody who is an underdog. Um, and from there, I just started writing and it was, it was great fun. Well, you, you talk about your love for music. I just want you to know the amount of time I talk, spent talking to Quentin Schaffer, <laughs> we did not talk about HBO business ever. It's if true. I took any kind of instruction, it came from Mara or Nancy or anybody else at that <laughs> company. And when it's, you and I got together, all we talked about was music and you oh. about this concert and this band and this guitar player. Yeah. You, you love music. Oh yeah, and you did, that's what I love talking about you. I wish I had somebody like you on the East Coast to do that with because you know so much and you've been to so many shows. I would remember going to shows, didn't matter where it was, you know, be maybe a show at the Garden or maybe it's Dave Grohl's birthday party at the Forum and you were at the, all of these. And this is after working a whole week of doing events. I said, this is unbelievable. It's like you had the golden pass. Well, um, I love music myself. So that's, you know, it's been propelled me. You grew up, where did you grow up? In New York? I grew up in Connecticut and actually, but went to school in California for college and tried to get a job out there. Um, and at the time couldn't and ended up back in the East Coast. I always expected to live in California, Jeff. And uh, so and, what, what was your first concert, your first major show and where was it? Yeah, I can tell you, it was amazing. Uh, the first concert uh, was, um, Edgar Winter, and he played in Connecticut outside in a school, uh, a field that, uh, you know, in the back of a junior high school, basically, with a stage set up and all. It was incredible. And you could wander around, and the music was terrific. And this is before he wrote Frankenstein. This is, you know, this is all of his early stuff. You know, keep playing that rock and roll. And, and I was just mesmerized. First, seeing him, he looks surreal like he's just you can't and he looks he's like alabaster right his alabaster it's incredible and he looks like so rock star and then the songs were just great and i just from there on in i started getting addicted to music and started buying going to kmart and you know caldors was a store we had buying albums every penny i would get um you know i was spending it toward uh mus music Aren't you jealous now that everybody has this unlimited access to uh, all this I'm, music? I'm so jealous. And I got a, a stacks and stacks of CDs that I never play because you can get it so easily. I mean, Spotify, just like that. And uh, great lists. Um, so I don't know what I'm going to do with those CDs. I know I made a mistake and gave away a lot of my vinyl. And, um, you know, then you're hearing all the vinyls back. And I don't yeah, know. Well, actually, I, I, when I was in Miami, I went to a, a sound a, a, a place where you, people go to buy home stereos. Oh, yeah. The guy only sells two left and right channel stereos, not mm. 5.1, not in home, just for music listening. And I haven't actually sat down and, pat, you know, actively <laughs> listen to music. Yeah. Or I, usually I'm listening to passively where it's in the background and I'm just doing things. But here I'm sitting down and I'm listening and he put on some vinyl for me. Uh -huh. And then he actually said that CD players, the new, the new land of CD players are even a hundred times better than they used to be. Wow. And that he, he's like, you need to get a new CD player. And I'm like, I didn't want to have the heart to tell him I got rid of all my CDs. Oh, I know. I know. That's the, that's the thing. It's like, I, 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 
gave them to different people. And my sister who's a big music fan. She actually had saved them. She actually gave me a chunk of them back, you know, <laughs> and I wrote my name all over the top, you know, so in case I, you know, if you lend them, you get them back. Um, but I love the opening the album cover and, and the album covers were amazing. And the inside jacket, there was always some great stuff in there. And um, well, we used to wait for an album drop. And then I remember having, when I lived in Atlantic city, if you oh, wanted yeah. something obscure, you had to go to a record shop and actually order it. Oh yeah. It would get delivered. They'd call you your, re your, your records here. Oh, it's true. I was unbelievable. It, it, it was, uh, and I knew I kind of, I forget what all the magazines I, but I always knew the stuff that was coming out. I'd find out what day is it Tuesday that it's coming in. And, and then I would be there and I would buy, uh, you know, I remember buying Carol King tapestry, never heard it, heard her songs before the day it came out, you know, like, okay. And then I bought James Taylor and then I bought Led Zepp, you know, I bought them all and just built this very wide ranging, uh, genres of music. Um, because I sort of found something to like in everything. Yes, well, in here, your geeky music dumb actually shows. Because <laughs> you have some parts in here. I mean, it's it has a lot to do with music and guitars, and it's almost like a guitar, uh, you know, it's a guitar club, which is really yeah. interesting now because we've really turned away from instruments and uh, the music now is all EDM. And then at the same time, I see these TikTok videos of these beautiful girls just shredding the hell out of these guitars. Yeah, in fact, uh, you're right. In fact, one of the most impressive, and actually I referenced her in my book because I was so impressed with her is, um, she's an LA girl, uh, 17 years old, Jasmine Starr. Do you know her, Jeff? I don't, but I'm gonna have to check her out. Check her out, Jasmine Starr music. She shreds a guitar better than any of the greats out there. You, I mean, Eddie, Van, she's doing Eruption for Eddie Van Halen. She's doing, you know, some of the best Henrik songs. The girl, she's 17 years old and she's just a phenomenon. And uh, I stumbled on her one day. And then when I'm writing the book and the book has seen kids who are really expert guitarists, I wanted that one of them to reference her in the book. And so there's a little thing there where she gets, a, I guess a shout out in a sense. Um, but check her out. Uh, last thing I saw she did, she had like 120,000 views. I probably saw her as one of the girls when I flipped by that I'm just like, cause I'm oh. a frustrated guitar player, as you know, and it's just exactly. like watching these girls, you're like, what, you're a teenager and you're playing like this? And I'm an old man, I can't play like that. Oh, I know. Then you should be careful checking her out cause it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's surreal. The, the young kid in my book um, is a phenomenal guitar player and he's only 10, she's 17. But I'm, in my mind, he's playing like she's playing, but she's playing so well. I don't know how you can get any better. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, Taz Niedermeyer, I don't know if you know this kid, but he started playing. Do you know Taz? Uh, I know that I don't know him personally, but I know no, him. But you know who I'm talking yeah, about. Absolutely. Oh, he's he's going to be on the show in the next couple of weeks. Incredible, oh, incredible shredder. And if he was playing, when, when I would see him play, the guitar was bigger than him. Oh, well, oh that's great. I love he, that. He's holding the guitar. You're like, what the heck? Oh yeah. Well, I'll bet you during this pandemic, you know, this is a great time for people play, being home and playing guitar and learning guitar. I, I would bet there, I wonder if there was some sort of surge in guitars during this period. Um, I, I believe that, yes. I believe the answer to that is yes, that people have been buying more instruments and learning and uh, the sales are up in that, even though places like Guitar Center are closing. And I know. You know. Are they closing permanently? Or no, no, no. But you know, they've cut but down. Gonna, yeah, yeah, exactly. Because they do some great stuff there. You know, some great yes, promotions. They do. Um, so, do, are there more of these in the works? Well, yeah. So I'll tell you a little bit on this. Um, so this book, when I wrote this book, um, you know, uh, there was a guy in LA, Chris Day, who worked at UTA, and uh, I called him. I said, you know, I, I wrote a, I'm writing this new book, and I, and I had sent some chapters out to get an agent. Now, many years ago, I did have an agent, but I couldn't keep, I couldn't do writing because I was really at HBO. So I hadn't had an agent since the nineties. Um, so I went to try to get an agent. You sent him 25 pages uh, and went to about, I don't know, 14 different people and either got no's or um, no response. So Chris Day said to me, he said, Quentin, I'm just giving you a piece of advice. If you have a passion for this, just do it. Nowadays, you can publish a book, you can make your own movie, you can start your own online <laughs> streaming show. And he said, there's nothing to hold you back. And, and you know, his, he said this to me one day and it stuck in my head. And um, 
And then I just did it. I said, you know, let me find out. And the writing part, Jeff, was the easy part. The hard part was the publishing side because there's so many options. There's Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, hardcover, paperback, um, uh, ebook, uh, you know, and then all the various uh, distributors for those. So once I got the book done, I, you know, I had to learn the publishing side. And then on top of all that, there's the marketing side. And the marketing side, most authors hate the most um, because they're used to a solitary, you know, existence, living in a little room and doing their writing. Um, and I, I sort of, I, I actually tuned in uh, the other night, uh, there was an interview with two authors. I'm now looking at these author interviews and it was John Grisham interviewing Harlan Coben. And uh, Harlan had a new book out and next month uh, Grisham has a new book out. So they're both gonna, they're gonna then swap. So Grisham is interviewing Coben about this. And they say, oh boy, those book tours, the marketing, and these are the top of the game. Those were brutal, but you had to do it. You had to do it to get your book sold. And they were traveling, living out of suitcases. Now they're doing Zoom. And they do six things like last night. The call, people were calling in from Brazil, and you know, and they were just talking for an hour about their books. And they said the writing part uh, was easy because they would write. The next day they'd go back in their little studio for four hours, and then they would edit and then write again. And they said the only difficult thing they had in the writing side was the names in the book uh, because. Grisham said, he, he usually has 200 names in a book. He said, just, oh God, do I use uh, this childhood friend's name? Should I use Jeff Kravitz's name? Who should I use? And he finally would go to like a telephone book or, you know, so, but the marketing side, that was the tough thing. So when I'm through with this, I actually, um, you know, a couple of people said this should be made into a movie. You know, it, if it gets made into a movie, that would help book sales. But So that's one avenue to go. But I do have a sequel for this um, because I, it ended in a, in a way where it's a satisfying ending, but I also have a whole couple of things I got to explore. And well, I want you have a to character answer. that's 10 years old as your protagonist. <laughs> exactly. Your upside is decades. <laughs> I could go for quite some time. It's true. And the next, uh, you know, the next sequel would start when he's basically 11. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, at that rate. <laughs> exactly. I could be writing longer than George R. R. Martin at this rate. <laughs> and do you find it satisfying now when you look at it and you hold it? I mean, you're happy with the way the product looks. I mean, the cover's really great. Oh, yeah, you thank the you. Kid with a guitar on his back right there with the lightning bolts coming down. and Exactly. And that's a- that Whose is who's art is this? Well, you know, it's interesting. You'll love this. Um, the When I did the book cover, I found a guy in London, not very expensive, uh, Jeremy. I'm trying to remember Jeremy's last name. And he said, he does book designs. He said, what do you want in it? I said, well, let me go online. I'll go to Shutterstock and go to, you know, a couple of the photo services. And Shutterstock actually had some, some great images. And I think Canva had a great image. And, you know, when you're signing up initially, they're free. They said, you know, they want to get you monthly and so forth. Right, but, yeah, I, I use Canva for my graphics. It's an amazing it's little amazing. Uh, It's amazing. So I, I go on there and um, I said, boy, I love this backdrop. And in fact, there's a scene in my book where or uh, the young kid and these other young kids are, they're all playing guitar when a huge storm is coming on and that's the lightning bolts are coming down. Um, so this, you know, the background on the cover is two meanings. That's an actual scene, but also gods of sound, you're thinking it's fire from the gods. And and there's a, uh, so I, I, I went through this, um, came up with the book title, uh, came up with the cover design, uh, and then you got to come up with the, the jacket copy. And it's just, it's, it's endless. and. Um, I think uh, if you had an agent and a publisher that are really doing a lot more of that for you, it would be a huge relief. Right, but you're not at that stage because this is your first foray into this. <laughs> not near, not nearly. In fact, um, I basically started with, and I got to do my count, I started with 14 uh, rejections. But unlike these great authors, and do you know some of the stats on these great authors? J.K. Rowling's uh, first Harry Potter was rejected by 12 publishers. Wow. Um, John Grisham, uh, his first book, uh, Time to Kill, was rejected by 28 publishers. Um, one of my favorites was Joseph Heller, Catch-22. Yes. Uh, Catch-22 was actually written as Catch-18. And there was another book coming out at the same time, Mila-18. So his publisher said, you know, you got to change the title. He said, I'll do Catch-22 because I got rejected 22 times before I got my book deal. So, well, and then Hunger Games, 60 
rejections. 60. Six zero. Wow. Um, yeah. So I got to the point where do I want to sit after my 14 rejections from literary agents and then just keep sending it out? Or do I want to just take charge and do it myself? And you know, I had the time on my hands without the job, and I did it. And I'm kind of glad to have gone through the experience. It was um <laughs> <laughs> well, it, 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 it builds character and it also shows that you, you're never too old to learn. Exactly. And I learned a lot. I learned so much, just like you've learned so much, right, about this whole streaming business. Well, being like, on this side of the camera is a complete departure for me, as you know. Exactly. This has not been my forte. Uh, but but you, got, you got really good at it, doing the, the cuts and the edits. And, you know, I love how you, you've designed it. Um, well, well, thank you. How do people get a hold of this? Is it on Amazon? Yeah. Yep, it's on Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble. It's um, in ebook, uh, paperback. Um, uh, um, you know, you can uh, bookstores. The problem with bookstores, bookstores probably do not have it, though they could, uh, because bookstores get hundreds of thousands of books a year domestically. I think I've read six hundred to eight hundred thousand books are published domestically, and bookstores, especially smaller ones, can't carry them all. Um, but nowadays, you can get a book the next day on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, and those are really the best. Well, do you think that you got a series in here? Do you think it could be? You know, I do think uh, there is. I think it's one of these things. It could. It's a trilogy, I believe, because I know where the second chapter would be, and but after the second chapter ends, there has to be a one for a final resolution. I don't know why three is the magic number because it is. Well, the, I, who knows? It could be three or three hundred. I mean, I once it's tired. But I can see three, and I think um, if I did that, I could tie up enough of the loose ends and end with a twelve-year-old protagonist <laughs> or older. <laughs> um, but it, but I I think they you know if I do another, I'm hopeful that. Um, you know, I'll get enough attention for this one that I will have an agent to uh, help navigate through some of those channels. Yeah. And if not, they just take part of your money anyway, or you have exactly. to pay them. And Exactly. That's the tough thing. It's true. You, the publishing business is a really tough business and how people make money. And it's amazing. Yeah. Um, everything. I don't even want to buy. I don't want to own anything hard anymore. I exactly. want everything on my phone. Exactly. And that's what's happening. You know, every, my kids use Kindle. Um, you know, people using uh, Apple Books or you know um, uh, uh, Google or your Amazon eBooks, your Kindles. Uh, there's so many different ways uh, to read it, and you don't have to have the, the book. I still like holding a book. You know, going to the beach or you know um, sitting outside reading at night. Uh, that would still be my preference. Yeah, but you're old like me, so. Exactly. Thank you, Jeff. That's <laughs> the way. It's a, different eras. I mean, that's what it is. I, I'm not afraid of getting older. I'm afraid of not getting older. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, exactly. In fact, I said to my wife the other day, we were talking about getting older and stuff, and, and somebody was talking about, well, do you believe in life after death? And I said, you know, if there's life after death, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be ready for a nice big rest. Exactly. <laughs> incredible. Well, you know, working with you over the years and the, all the incredible people, I mean, too many to even mention the decades of people that we've gone through. I mean, hundreds of employees through that HBO press department alone. It's true. They, we had amazing people. I mean, the most amazing, obviously, Nancy Lesser, who was a legend and just um you know she left after i did um and but the two of us we i spent you know boy it's like 30 years of my life or no more than that, i think 34 years of my life with her and she was like um you know we were just best friends and we we went through so much together talked every day uh, or almost every day um and so when you certainly that ends you know we we keep in touch but that was a big shock um and then all the others, I'm telling you, Angela Tarantino and Cecile Cross Palmer and Kelly and um, Michael McMorrow, Lauren McMahon. They, they, we had this, this all-star group of people. And, um, you know, and some of them have left the company. Some are still there. Uh, but there's none better. Um, and I'll, and I, when I say that, I say it because Mara McGillian won over people that were really hard to win over, you know, uh, Game of Thrones, Band of Brothers, Spielberg, Getzman, and so forth. Angela Tarantino with the Sex and City Lays. That's the first show I gave her. And she took this, she basically was the publicist for three of the talent, or two of the talent, uh, when it started. Uh, no, three. Chris Noth, 
Kristen Davis and Cynthia Nixon. Cynthia then got Kelly Bush, uh, but Angela, they loved her so much, they even wanted her to work on the movies. And then <laughs> The Sopranos, Angela Gandolfini never had anyone do his publicity unless they went through Angela after Sopranos even ended. Uh, you know, Angela was his pick. And Cecile, my favorite story about Cecile, this is why they're so good. They work with this talent. Cecile worked on the first season of The Wire. That very first season, who was in it? For, what 14 year old was in it? Michael B. Jordan. Oh, geez. Cecile got to know the talent, but also she took care of this young kid. She got to know his family in Newark. Uh, and she, they really appreciate that. And he was in for that first season, but he never forgot it. They never forgot it. She kept in touch with them all those years. We did other things with him. Um, and the same is true with Angela. When the job ends with these shows, they keep in touch with these talent and they, these talent, there's such a relationship there. Um, you know, Nancy Lesser did it on a level with, you know, the mega people, you know, the Nicole Kidmans and stuff. And it, it was just great to see that. Um, well, you one thing about HBO, we're family. We're family, exactly, Jeff. You were, boy, you were at more probably HBO events than even I was. <laughs> the, I, I, used to, I used to joke that the only thing I, I don't get here is a retirement package, but I was pretty much <laughs> an HBO employee for, for over three decades. Oh, you were. And I'm telling you, uh, you were the best because you somehow were everywhere. If somebody was at an event, you captured them. And you had this great style of doing it. You'd come up like really easy going with the camera. You sort of flip the camera up. You'd click like three shots. I said, did he really get that? You, you'd turn to look at it. Brilliant. You'd show the you know, brilliant shots. It was just this great thing. And uh, I think um, we were lucky to have you. I mean, really, it was uh, amazing. Well, we, were, this we were all, you know, the interesting thing was we were all figuring it out at the same time. I was figuring out how to work my camera. You guys were figuring out how to make TV shows. And we all kind of grew up together. It's true. Uh, learning, our tr learning our art and our trade. It's and true. it was an honor. I I'm blessed. Oh, yeah, you're right. Because remember, you when you were first doing the photos, you know, before digital, it was a whole other thing. That's right. Uh, yeah, in the 80s, late 80s, when I started working with Mara, it was, it was film. And yeah. that was, you know, next day. And I, you know, it's funny. Last night, I was over at Giorgio Baldi for this uh, <laughs> camp high, trendy event. And okay. I ran into Michael, who owns Roots, who you oh, know Aspen. Oh, yeah. Remember that? And wow. I was like, wow, we used to do the U.S. Comedy Arts Festival yeah. with you guys. And you guys used to sponsor all the clothing. Oh, yeah. And it mm. just took me back to going to Aspen every year. Remember that? Eight. Oh, the Monte Carlo. It's all Breck skiing problem. Um, I know it's true, but we're glad he had that because, you know, we saw Monty Python's reunion. We saw, I mean, I Gigi remember. Kong reunion, Monty Python, uh, Robin Williams. I mean, uh, Chris Farley up there with David Spade. And just oh, like It was incredible. And I remember seeing a fairly unknown comedian there sitting next to Nancy Lesser. I laughed harder than I've ever laughed. And I, and I was part of this, I couldn't get enough air. And it turned out the comedian was Louis CK, who at the time, no one knew, I didn't know who he was. And he was so freaking funny for me that that out to Nancy, I think she thought I was having a heart attack. She was sitting next to me laughing because I was laughing. So. <laughs> well, you know, we, we were, we were in rarefied air there in Aspen to begin with. There wasn't much air. Oh yeah. <laughs> Everybody had to adjust to the attitude. And the one thing about bringing Hollywood up to Aspen is as, as fancy as it all is, it, it took everybody's defenses down and we all, everybody kind of had a good time. It's true. It really was fun. And, and it became a huge draw for talent. They wanted to come there. Um, so you were getting these mega comedians and private jets flying all these people in. Uh, we used to always remember the first, the start of it, we'd always do a press conference with, you know, like 10, 12 of the major talent on it uh, to get, you know, publicity attention. Uh, and, but it was fun. It really was a, a, a great thing. And those comic relief events, the same thing. Uh, just when can you gathering so many? Yeah, well, that blew my mind. But like being backstage and being the comic relief photographer for HBO. Oh yeah, was, you were just like wow. Like you, when you did that big shot at the end where they set oh. everybody up and photographed seventy of the biggest comedians of the time together. Oh, it's it was, true. It, you, I couldn't believe the combinations and the people and the way they treated each other. You know, you had the older oh. guys and the younger guys all oh, connecting. Yeah. It, it was amazing. Those are just great shows, really historical documents and also did a really good thing at the time. Um, you know, when you look at uh, 
that show coming about with you know Bob Zamuda, Chris Albrecht's former partner. Um, you know when they were like the comedy duo of comedy from A to Z, as Chris told me. <laughs> you won't find it in any books. <laughs> um, but uh, you know he, to his credit, he you know really made that um, a major cause. And I I think I think comic relief. I know somebody's still I think. Uh, picked up a mantle and is there's no concerts for it, but I believe there's still efforts on that behalf. I've got to look into that, but yeah, that, that went to the homeless, correct? Wasn't that? That was correct. Exactly. Uh, there were about, I think 26 major cities uh, that they had homeless shelters that they benefited, but they always had on the show these, that you'd have a funny comedian and then you'd have this really poignant piece about some family that's living in their car and, um, and you just, it's, the money was, would pour in. Um, and there were all these rules because HBO, we couldn't do advertising, couldn't be like fundraiser, but there was ways you could do it so that people could make these contributions. There's be an 800 number at the bottom. Um, and um, yeah, it was great. It was, I can't even remember. I think we did eight of those maybe, Comic Relief. It was, uh, that was one of the most memorable uh, things and, and annual events. Yeah, uh, absolutely incredible legacy, Q. Yeah, I, I can tell you, I um, think I got so lucky landing there and watching it evolve. And I always say, you know, I used to every year talk to the interns and I just said, listen, everybody wants to go to this, this, this. But sometimes you get in the ground floor of a place that's, you know, a little rebellious and sure making its way. I said it can be a great fun ride to be in from the very start. And I think a lot of these internet companies, um, you know, really um, are doing that right now. You know, that, I mean, the, sm the, young, the smaller ones and now the bigger ones, they still bring in young recruits, but it's, you know, you're part of a big corporation now. It's, um, but HBO was an anything goes place at the time, which was really fun. And it was a ton of fun. And it, it, I just, some of my favorite people I've ever met, HBOers. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, as I said, there's still some left there, but I always kept thinking when I leave HBO, you can come back and walk down the hall and say hi to everybody. And first off, there's no hall to walk down because they're <laughs> not back. But a lot of the people I work with, you know, have gone. And um, so it's- Yeah, you, we, it's it's end of an era. I mean, we definitely, we did it right. We had an amazing run, but it ended. And you actually probably got out. I mean, I'm sure it didn't feel that way at the time. Because yeah. you, you you have a lot of life left in you, and I'm sure the, our other friends that were all working there with us felt the same way at the time. The bittersweetness of having to leave oh, yeah. such an amazing job. We have these amazing experiences to go to who knows what. But now that you're looking at the way history played out, it's like, okay, this is all, everything's meant to be. And I think that we see that now. No, I agree with you. I agree. And um and one other thing, if I could just give a little plug to my next project, right? It's music related. Go ahead. Uh, Earwig the rapper. It's called Eat Dirt. Uh, I got a video online. And if you go to the video, this is uh, you type in hip hop's biggest, baddest audition. You're going to see just a glimpse of this. But it's basically I'm doing an animated TV series, developing it about a young little bug who wants to be a rapper. He's flunked out of pre-K seven times. And uh, he has no talent whatsoever, but he's trying to make it. And he's a bug in a bug world, which means... You're seeking celebrity um, in a short attention span world. So if you get it, no one remembers. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely classic. Well, keep yourself occupied with these amazing projects. Everybody out there, pick up a, a copy of Gods of Sound. Very well written, very well done. I wouldn't expect anything less from you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Is it? Yeah, listen, I miss you. Can't wait to see you at the next concert, whenever that will be. And I do believe concerts are gonna come back strong um, as will uh, theater and movies, because we're desperate to get out of the house. That's for damn sure. Q, thank you so much for coming on 420 Live today. Anytime. Love it. Thank you. Quentin Jeff. Jaffer, everybody. Gods of Sound. Check it out <laughs> at Amazon. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. All right. There you go. An hour like that. <sighs> what can I say? Quentin, HBO. I love you guys. That's it for us here at 420 Live. We've used our entire hour. Thank you all of our friends for tuning in today. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about this shit show down in Miami. Talk about changing gears with our friend Angus Thomas. 
my photographer friend that's out there covering the scene. He was quoted in the USA Today this morning in an article about what's happening in Miami. And uh, what could I say? It's been a great, great show. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you all my oh, friends and family from HBO. I love you guys. Miss you. And uh, I'll see you all tomorrow. Jeff Kravitz, 420 Live, getting emotional, signing off. Have a great day.